Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Great to be here. Um, actually, I'm an ex-academic, and it's really nice to be back in a lecture theatre, particularly as I still use chalkboards, which is, which is very exciting. Though I'm using something that I've never used before, so I'm going to hover here because I'm terrified it's going to go wrong. Uh, apparently, this is the new PowerPoint, so we'll, we'll see. Um, I was interested with Mary's phrase, the handbag economy, because she went, when she said that, I instantaneously thought of our obsession with consumerism and judging each other by whether we have the right handbag rather than our real intrinsic value. Uh, and that's what Beth alluded to, some work Oxfam's doing that we're launching on Tuesday, something called the Humankind Index, which is about better valuing those things that are really important to communities rather than just GDP. So keep a, a wee eye out for that next week. Um, there's been a lot of talk about house prices, there's been a lot of talk about credit, a lot of talk about money. Forgive me, but I want to talk about people uh, because I think they're very, very important. Uh, particularly, I want to talk about what's happening in the communities that Oxfam works with around the world, here in the UK and also overseas. I want to talk about their experiences, how they've been impacted by the machinations of the banking system and particularly the wider financial system in a broader sense. So firstly, at home, we've had the massive financial bailouts. We've had this socialisation of risk. The risks taken by the very few, the very remote, the very wealthy. But this has come at a massive cost. We've had severe cuts in public services. The public services that are our collective institutions that bind us together. They're those institutions that enable people to maintain dignity in the face of misfortune. And let me tell you, the worst is very much yet to come, but already Oxfam is seeing the impact. We're seeing increased use of our food banks as unemployment and cuts to welfare hit hardest. We're seeing increased anxiety as people are told that they no longer qualify for benefits. And we're also seeing increased suicides already. Add into that the continued tolerance, and I cannot understand why, this continued tolerance of outrageously high bonuses and you see a picture of power and privilege and state support that's skewed very much to those who need it least. Further add in price rises, and particularly price rises in food that's caused by global commodity speculation, and what you've got is a perfect storm that's hitting the poorest of our communities. And what Oxfam's seeing in the communities that we work with here in the UK is that people are starting to ration themselves, just simply to scrape by. They're falling into debt, they're going into depression. And every time it's women who are hit hardest, they're losing out to most. They're sacrificing their own nourishment, their own needs, so that their children are warm and are fed. And while, of course, the financial crisis might have been caused by the severing of finance from the actual needs of communities here in the Western developed countries, its impact is felt grossly around the world. So I want to talk about what's happening overseas. And again, Oxfam is seeing this in the communities that we work with in countries around the world. And what we've seen is happening is this financialization of food, as the monthly trade in food futures has reached the point of frenzy. Now, if you take one statistic away today, think about this one. In 1996, the speculation in the food futures market accounted for about 12% of that market, just as recently as 1996. In 2011, 61% of the food futures market was speculative. Now, that is purely callous gambling on life-sustaining commodities. And what it does is it increases food prices. And last year, we saw 44 million people pushed into hunger because of these rising food prices. And what happens is it's, you see in increased tension and stress. And many commentators and analysts have attributed, in part at least, the Arab Spring to the distress and the tensions caused by rising prices. And at the individual level, it's the poorest who suffer because they spend such a significant proportion of their income in food. So what the poorest communities are doing is that they're changing their diets, they're selling their assets, they have to go into debt, so they're sacrificing their future, 
and enduring pain and distress in the present. Now look at the last of the three of the last three of these points here: domestic violence, children at risk of stunting and impaired cognitive development, people migrating in search of food. Now I don't know if bankers in Canary Wharf or bankers in Wall Street or even bankers in Sydney, when they're playing with numbers on their screen, if they think about the human impact. I doubt they do. But they need to hear it. And they need to hear it not from me at a conference in Edinburgh, though important and fundamental those conferences. I think they need to hear it from the people themselves. <laughs> We need to really make sure that food prices are kept under control because the ones who are hit the worst by it are the poor. People who live in extreme poverty, along with those who are moving out of poverty, and people who live with extreme wealth, they're all interconnected through the global food economy. And this is summed up so very profoundly by the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food, who says, the situation facing millions of families around the world is a silent mass murder due entirely to man-made actions. Folks, that's our banking and financial system that's doing that. But before we go to coffee, I want to end on something maybe a little bit constructive. One solution, at least in part, of, that's been proposed by Oxfam and others of how we can reduce this speculative and casino-style banking the Robin Hood tax. It's proposed that it's going to raise about 20 billion in the UK alone each year to be spent on domestic and global poverty reduction and climate change adaptation. I couldn't resist. You've probably seen this before, but it's a delight. Have you had this idea about the Robin Hood bankers tax? Yes. It's a sweet little idea, taxing the banks to help the poor, but I I don't think it'll work. It's very complicated and will be very tough on the banking sector. Which has just been given billions of pounds of taxpayers' money to keep it going. Well, yeah, of course. And it's still paying itself billions of pounds in bonuses. Yes. So the tax is a charge on all bank transactions that don't include members of the public. Bonds, derivatives, currency, speculative stuff. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Very complex. So the bankers would give... How much from each deal they do? Um, 25%? <laughs> well, no, not that much. 10%? No. 5%? No, not 5 More or less? Slightly less. What, 1%? Not quite. Half of 1%? No. A tenth of a percent? No. Half of that? They give around 0.05% of every deal? Yeah, that's about right. And sometimes it'd be even less. That doesn't sound like a lot to most people. No, I can see that. <laughs> Isn't he amazing? With one eyebrow, he can <laughs> say so much. <laughs> so who supports it? Well, people like Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy, the Pope, Bill Gates, Oxfam, the STUC, probably many organisations here. Actually, should we just have a show of hands? Who thinks Robin Hood tax is a good idea? Anyone who doesn't? Well, those of you who don't, go to along to my colleague Sarah's discussion in the panel sessions. Uh, this is the company that you keep. The British bankers are resisting it. Uh, on their behalf, perhaps, so are Osborne and Cameron. And despite uh, this idea of build, making Scotland a beacon of progressive policies, Alex Salmond has yet to come out in support of the Robin Hood tax. So give him a nudge whenever you see him. So you're going to hear later about the Robin Hood tax from my colleague Sarah, but I guess for the, my message is for the rest of the day, when you're talking about solutions, when you're exploring how that you could, you could make banking more just, please remember to put the human need and put human impact at the heart of your proposals. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Catherine. <laughs> Three questions we have time for. Go for it, Steve. Um, I don't think the Robin Hood tax is a terrible idea, but uh, it's, it's problematic in the sense that it, it distracts from some of the root causes of the problems that we've heard discussed in the other sessions. So I'm just wondering how you square it with that. 
Uh, we've heard from both of you guys before, so I'm, I'm going to prioritize somebody who hasn't already asked a question, if there is anyone. Yep, in the middle there. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I was just wondering, um, yeah, I would just like to re repeat what the, the previous question said. Um, uh, perhaps you might have a situation where, because of the Robin Hood tax, you'd actually see a justification through the taxes that are being paid on that to maintain the current system. Whereas I think um, perhaps the Robin Hood tax is, um, well, rather than you know, cut off the leaf of the problem, maybe we've seen earlier on that um, there's actually the monetary system mm -hmm. that is allowing all this wealth to be transferred into the bankers. And I think you, you really have to get to the root of the problem rather than um, allow the, problem, the initial problem to exist and then try, try to apply something else to, to get rid of it. Do you see what I mean? So, um, how, yeah, how would you describe with that? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to be really dull and I agree. Oh, sorry, third. One more. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm going to go with someone who hasn't spoken. Yeah. Um, I've discussed the Robin Hood tax and several times in groups, and I think the biggest problem we saw was mm -hmm. that a way around it would be found. That, that, that there'd be some way of shifting things around so, so it, it wasn't such a problem, and it'd be very difficult to, to just to get the, the justification right across the board. Mm. Sure, right. Uh, we never set out to say that Robin Hood tax is the panacea for everything. It's a tiny solution. It's something that can be implemented fairly quickly, fairly immediately, while we're getting on with the job of changing the whole structure that is so pernicious and so deleterious to the impact of communities and, and individuals. So it's not being positioned as the only solution. We very much talk about it as one part of the solution. If it's so simple, let's just get on and do it. It's not about trying to challenge the whole system. It's not set up as that. And I can completely agree that the root, it's not about the root causes. I disagree with some of the conversations last night. To me, inequality is at the heart of absolutely everything. It's the heart of our environmental sustainability. It's the heart of the suffering in our communities. It's at the heart of the extent of poverty and the inequality and the way we use the system. That's the root cause. Poverty is a matter of distribution, and that's where we need to focus. And if the banking system can be part of addressing poverty and inequality, then that's brilliant. And the Robin Hood tax, I guess what it does usefully is brings attention to the gross inequalities of who's benefiting out of the banking system and where state support is being skewed. So it's useful in that, but we're not arrogantly saying this is going to sort everything out. We're saying it's just something simple, let's get on and do it, and it can have such a positive impact if we're talking in the means of 20 billion a year just in the UK. But Sarah will have a lot more detail, so uh, she knows it a lot better than I do too. So if you need more detail, more discussion, go and, go and have a conversation.